and gracious God. Just stand with me. We're going to turn to 1 Chronicles 16. We're going to read 23 to 31. <laughs> it's all right. Our, uh, our vacation was like a working vacation. We, uh, we don't know how to sit still. Me and Amanda were talking, and I'm like, we're just, we're just not wired that way. So we, even if we were to go on our own, we always have to find something. We're not going to sit around in a hotel room. We're not going to sit around idly by maybe for about half a day. That's about it. So going to Tennessee and helping Brother George work on his on his uh, his property was it's therapeutic for me. I don't know about anybody else, but most people say, man, you want a vacation to work? Yeah, that's just how I'm wired. But uh, it's a privilege and honor because what it's being used for is for the Lord. It's a uh, it's a vacation spot for ministers. Um, eventually, it'll it'll more than likely it will have services conducted there, and I would like to see great fire on the mountain. That would be awesome. That's that's my vision. I don't know about them, but that's my vision is to have ser- services on the mountain. And for all that to spread throughout the valley, that would be awesome. If you're there, say amen. I won't try to keep you too long. The Word of God says, Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord and the beauty and holiness. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable, that it not be moved. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice, and let men say among the nation, The Lord reigneth. I want to talk to you a little while about what the service of the Lord is all about. It's all about worshiping the one who is worthy. To worship the Lord Almighty in the good times, And in the bad. In a moment, and whatever you're going through, to do the ultimate. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Father, I love you, Jesus. I pray that you would help us in this meeting. Help me. Anoint me as we gather to seek your face. The only one is worthy of praise. Lord, I pray that you would touch every mind and heart. Stir our spirits, O Lord. For you and all that you do for us, we will give you glory, honor, and praise for it. In the mighty name of Jesus. And all that love him shout it. Amen. Amen. And our text is Psalmist urges all men to speak of the glory of the Lord. Fear is his due as the God of creation. Glory is due as God of splendor, strength, and majesty. Do we do we understand who we serve? Do, do we look at him as a king? Yes, he humbles himself and brings us. He comes to our level. But in all honesty, he reigns supreme over everything. I was talking to somebody the other day, and I said, what you have to understand is the Lord is not on our timetable. He stands outside of time as we go through life. He stands outside that, and he sees this is why he can exist past, present, and future. He can see all that is going to take place and all that has already been done. He sees it all at once. I said, if you really try to understand the mindset of the Lord, it will drive you crazy. We were never ever equipped to understand that. But if we realize that he stands outside and he creates, 
He is the king, all supreme over all of creation. Everything that's been done, that it has done, it is the Lord's. But do we look at it that way? Probably not. Joy is his due as a God who sustains and reigns over the world. King David had just returned the ark to Israel. That's what we find in our text, right? As soon as he had, as soon as he had happened, it's time to celebrate. The burnt offering were the highest expression of worship ceremonially possible. It was wholly consumed by the flames and ascended in the smoke to be enjoyed by God alone. The other sacrifices were the peace offerings. They were the only Levitical offering in which everyone had a part in. The fat and the kidneys were offered up to the Lord upon the altar. A portion of the remainder went to the priest, and the rest was given to the offerer to be shared with his family and friends before the Lord. We would praise the Lord, right? We offer ourselves at this point. We don't, we don't kill animals anymore, but we offer ourselves, our time, our money, everything should be offered to the Lord. Everything we spend with the Lord. Do we sit down two hours to watch TV? Before we know it, we find that, uh-oh, I spent three or four. And then we go to bed. But that's the time that could have been spent with the Lord, right? The Israel nation are instructed to sing the greatness of the Lord and to seek the Lord's face and to remember the Lord's great deeds, to sing songs about his glory and praise his name. But all that is worship, singing some tunes, shouting his name, is that all worship is? What is worship? To some people, worship is about playing an instrument, singing. People have expressed worship in many ways, no doubt. The most common words for worship translated in the Bible meant to kneel or lay face down before someone as an act of reverence. Biblical worship is acknowledging that God is king over the universe and results in living lives in that truth. Ah, uh, this is where it gets tricky. People will say, I worship the Lord, and they come into a church service, but when they go outside the doors, uh, we don't tend to live it that way, do we? I'm not, I'm not trying to beat up on anybody. I'm talking to myself as well. Not that we do anything bad, but do we do like the old people or the, the people of old? They had these great revivals. Do we live like they did? Where when you walked into a church service or you shook a preacher's hand, you knew without a shadow of a doubt, that was a man of God. Where you came into a church service and you sat, and if you weren't careful, you would get knocked off your feet. That's what we're missing. We have to worship we have to worship for whatever. We we tend to only worship when it's when we got money in the bank and we got nice things. We got a house. We tend to worship him in the good times. Well thank you, Lord, for what you've given me. What about in the bad? All right? We tend to pray. We tend to pray our guts out. But do we worship him then? Doesn't matter. No matter what circumstance you go with, he's still the same. He's still the same. I lost my place. He's still king over the universe. Worship is a beautiful and powerful reality if we understand it from the Lord's perspective. Both the primary words in Hebrew and Greek for worship in the Bible mean the same thing to bow down and lay one's face to the ground. It's an acknowledgement of the Lord's glory. There is someone who is transcendent and glorious, and he is worthy of all full devotion. Is he not? Praise the Lord. Second Chronicles 20, 20 through 25, 
And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and be ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. So shall ye be established, believe his prophets, so ye shall so ye shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord. And that should praise the beauty of the holiness as they went out before the army and say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood against up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an, an end of the inhabitants, every one helped to destroy another. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoils of them, they found among them in abundance of both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels which they stripped off for themselves for more than they could carry away and they were three days in gathering of the spoils it was so much a huge army had formed across the Dead Sea and had declared war on Judah King Jehoshaphat had rightfully was rightfully alarmed he proclaimed a fast and called the people to the temple where they prayed to the Lord. Jehoshaphat reminded the Lord that the Jews, the Jews were his chosen, chosen people. The temple where they were praying was God's sanctuary and that they were at a place where he promised to hear and answer prayers. Jehoshaphat closed his appeal to the Lord and with all of you just standing and waiting for the Lord to answer. That's where the church needs to be. It needs to get to. The Lord answered, spelling the fear that had gripped the nation, that the battle was the Lord's, and the people only had to go out the next day and see what the Lord had done. Praise the Lord. By faith, the people rejoiced in their victory even before it happened. The next morning, they were up at dawn to see what the Lord had done to the enemy. They marched to the battlefield as if they were going to a festival, singing. Singers lead, lead in the way. God confused the enemy when the Lord heard his people singing their songs of faith, causing them to fight and destroy themselves. When Judah arrived, the only thing they had to do was to collect the spoils, which took three days. There were so many. With un, unbounding joy, they praised the Lord and returned to Jerusalem singing. The neighboring nations took notice, and Judah enjoyed the praise. When you go to the Lord in prayer, and he gives you the answer, have faith. The trick is that you have to wait for the answer. A lot of the times, we come to the altar, and we just pray for a little while, and then we leave. Well, the Lord ain't going to show up today. You didn't wait long enough. You have to wait for the answer. Jehoshaphat prayed, waited for the answer, had faith, and then acted on that faith with praise and worship. There's something essential in the act of worship that enables us to encounter the power of God like nothing else. It is not effective to simply tell someone to stop worrying, to stop being proud, to stop being self-consumed, distracted, insecure, bound, or materialistic. But it is effective to tell them to start worshiping. Because the Lord will inhabit the praises of his people. When we make the decision to fix our eyes on Christ, we quickly realize that God has already begun to release the grip these tendencies can have on our lives. Worship is a declaration of our weakness and God's strength. I challenge you in your next moment of need to make that hard choice to be a worshiper, to let the breakthrough God 
fight your battles for you. I haven't even told Amanda this. So we drive up there. We leave Sunday more, uh, afternoon. We get up to Georgia Leases at about 10 o'clock. We kind of make a, a note of what we need and what we're going to try to accomplish for the week. <clears throat> so Monday we get up and we go to Walmart and we get some stuff, some food for the week, snacks for the kids. And while I'm in there, I'm not feeling real good. My chest kind of hurts. It's kind of weird. I'm getting weak. I don't really think much about it. As we go through Walmart and, and we do everything that we got to do, I start to realize that I keep, I, I'm having I'm having trouble speaking. Uh, like the thoughts in my head are not coming out. My words are reversed, or they're they just don't, they're jumbled. They don't make any sense. And I'm like, or uh, I'll go to speak and it'll just be more like. Bleh, bleh, bleh. But we're we're towards the end, so anyway, <laughs> we get to the van and I'm trying to talk to Mando about something and I'm like, I can't I can't get it out. And she's like, Are you okay? I said, I, I don't. I don't, I don't. I don't know if I'm having a heart attack or if I'm having a stroke. I don't know what's going on. And she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, I think so. And then all of a sudden my hands start tingling. And then this side of my this side of my eye, I can't see out of it. It's, it's like um, I can see, but I can't see. It's like, it's like looking at it. We don't see it anymore, but the TV that used to have snow on it when, when the channels went out at night, um, it's like looking, this eye is like looking through that snow. And I'm like, I can see, but it's like a whole bunch of floaters and they're all over the place. And my hands are going numb. And it's like, man, what in the world? And then I realize that this arm is, is getting that way. Like it's creeping up. And so what do I do? I get in the car and I'm going to drive because <laughs> I think I'm okay. I'm not all, I don't feel, I mean, I feel weak. But other than that, I'm like, yeah, I don't know what's going on. And then so I'm just kind of praying. I'm like, Lord, you want to do something. We in the mountains. I don't know why I'm driving. So we get back to Georgia leases, and some of it's gone, and some of it, I don't know, it was just kind of weird. And man says, eh, we need to go to the hospital. Y'all know me by now, I ain't going to the hospital. It's Monday. If I go to the hospital, what are they going to do? They're going to keep me. And they're going to run tests. And they're going to say, oh, well, Mr. French, we think you were having a stroke. Do you know that for sure? Oh, we don't really know because the symptoms are gone now. Oh, maybe you were having a heart attack. You are about to turn 48. Okay. Either way, they're going to keep me. That's two days of working for the Lord, and it's not going to get done. That's my mindset. I'm not going to the doctor. So anyway, those symptoms pass. And Tuesday we get up and we we finish the porch on the on the cabin and then they have to decide what they're gonna do about the railing. So they're deciding all that. And that's that's Tuesday no, that was Monday. We got back from the grocery shop and we did that. Sorry, excuse me. So then they have to decide what they're gonna do with the railing. Tuesday we get up and me and George fix the most electrical stuff around the house that been that had to been done and that it was a lot, so that took all day. And then on um, Wednesday, we went and we took the kids to see her dad. And uh, we spent time with him while they went and got the stuff for the railing. And then when we all got back to the house, there's two hours left. Hey, let's get, I've been riding all day, let's get to it. So we put the railing up and we get the cabin completely finished. Sweet. I will push myself to the break of destruction. It was for a good cause, right? I did it for so many years for nonsense. I might as well do it for the Lord this time. Thursday we get up and we we do the back porch and it, that's all done. Friday we got nothing else to do. So and then Friday night we drive home. We left at ten at yeah, about nine thirty. We made it back home about five five thirty somewhere around then. 
I slept for a couple of hours and got up. This part I have, man, it doesn't know. <clears throat> so I got my messages pretty much. They're done. I, I wanted to get them done before I left. That way I wouldn't have to be focused on them. Now, I'm not saying I didn't pray over them and review them and all that. And then so um, I come up here, and which I always do before service the night before. I come up here to pray late at night. And it's probably about 9, 30, 10 o'clock when I come in. And I'm like, man, I'm not feeling well. Like I felt it when I got out of the truck. And I'm like, Phew. I don't know what that's about. So I come in, and I, my stomach feels funny. And I'm like, maybe I need to go to the bathroom. And so I go in there, and I'm like, this ain't right. I'm like, I'm sweating profusely. Right now, which is not uncommon for me to sweat. But I'm inside the church house. I haven't done anything. I just start pouring sweat. I'm talking pouring sweat to the fact that it looks like I jumped in the pool. And I'm like, here I am. Uh-oh. What is going on? Because now I'm, it's hard to breathe, and I'm pulling at my shirt. And I'm like, here it is. They're going to find me tomorrow morning dead in the bathroom. I'm like, I got to get out of here. So I get out. And I come into the sanctuary, and I turn the AC down as low as I can get it. I'm still pouring sweat. And so I'm praying. I, I'm weak. And I collapse right over here in front of this pew. And I'm like, Lord, this is it. The devil says, you're done. I got you now. What you going to do? Man is hurt. She's in the bed. She can barely move. Her back, we think it's a pinch nerve. She's having problems getting around. Draven's house sitting. What am I going to do? I'm pretty sure I was actively having a heart attack. I'm oh, poor and sweat. I'm really surprised that the carpet's not stained or still soaked. I'm oh, poor. I can't breathe. Like, I'm contemplating taking my shirt off because I, I just can't. I can't get, I can't get a breath. Only thing I can do is just pray. Well, who am I going to call? I'm going to call the fire department. I'm going to call 911. I might not even be able to get the words out. Sir, what's the problem? <laughs> I bet it's funny, but it's just the reality of it. And so now I'm laying there. And the devil's like, yeah, you're done now. It's over with. You pushed it too hard this time. I've got you. I'm like, Lord, is this it? All the stuff that won't be done. Everybody that I'll leave behind. Not that I was thinking about giving up. I said, Lord, I'll preach your gospel. If you raise me off this floor. I don't know how much time went by. I can't tell you that. But I can tell you this. In the weakest moment, there is no strength left. A poor sweat. If I ever felt like it was the end, that was probably it. But if you come down here and you look, you will see claw marks in the carpet for where I pushed myself up and I praised him anyway. Whether I went out 
or I stay alive, you reign supreme. I praise him anyway. I love you, Lord, whether you raise me off this floor or not. You're the God of the universe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't look at it a lot. What else was I going to do? I'm in the middle of nowhere. I can't call nobody. It's 1030 at night. It might have been 11. But once I stood to my feet, I laid across that pew and fell asleep. And then I woke up. I wish I don't get cold very easy. When I woke up, I was shivering. I was so wet. And the temperature had dropped in here to about 70 degrees. And I was like, whoo! I'll get myself up and get out of here. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Acts 16, 16 and 28. And it came to pass, we went to prayer. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us and brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Ooh. Well, Paul, being Paul, right? He gets tired of this. I won't read the whole story. We find Paul and Silas, or Philippi, they're on their way to pray when they meet a slave girl who's possessed by a demon. She was able to foretell the future and to make astounding revelations. This is why she made her master's money. She had been following the Christians, missionaries, for many days now and starts to cry out that the men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Now, what she said was true, right? That's why Paul and Silas were there. Paul knew better than to accept the testimony from demons. Just like me. You're dead. You're done. That's it. It's over with. You can't accept that kind of nonsense. Paul was also saddened by the state of the enslaved girl. So in the all-powerful name of Jesus, he cast out the demon, and immediately she was freed from his bondage and became sane and a rational person. Our lives should be charged with the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost like Paul. We should be constantly seeking God's hand in, in the marvelous we should be experiencing events in our lives that lie beyond the laws of probability. We should be aware that God is uh, arranging contacts, opening doors, overruling oppositions. Me and Brother Tony were talking earlier, and he knew a guy, a pastor, that all the healings and stuff and the miracles that took place, they had a wall just full of trophies for what have God done. That's a testimony. What has the Lord done? Go look at that wall. And tell me what you see. Man, that's what I want to see. That's what I want to see. Our service, our service should crackle with the supernatural. We should see direct answers to prayers. When our lives touch other lives, we should see his hand in the breakdowns, delays, accidents, losses, and seeming tragedies. We experience extraordinary deliverances and aware and be aware of the strength, courage, and peace and wisdom beyond our natural limits. That's what we that's what we should be experiencing. We should be praising the Lord. In our lives, if our lives are lived only on the natural level, how are we any different from any non-Christians? God's will is that our lives should be supernatural, that the life of Jesus should flow through us. When this takes place, impossibilities will melt.
closed doors will open and the power of God will surge. Instead of being grateful that this girl is no longer demon-possessed, her masters were enraged and they were going to lose money. They dragged Paul and Silas before the magistrates on false charges made against them. And the citizens of the city claim they were troublemaker. They were troublemaking Jews trying to upset the Roman way of life. We're going to meet that kind of opposition if, if, we, if we live in a, in a state where God's power is magnified. Jesus even told us, don't find it strange that they hate you. They once hated me. Now, with all this accusations of troublemaking, the mob went crazy. They ripped off Silas and Paul's clothes. The angry mob beat them. After they were beaten, the missionaries were sent to jail with special instructions to keep them secure. The jailer put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks, all for preaching the gospel. The midnight hour found Paul and Silas go find them singing. Their joy was completely independent of the earthly circumstances. The source of all their singing was in heaven above. And that's where we have an issue. Everything is in our circumstances. We look at that. We don't look at the one outside the circumstance. It says, yep, I can fix that. I can heal that. Yep, I can do that. I can make things appear with nothing. Everything seems impossible. I find it I find it amazing that the the children of Israel walked around in the desert and their shoes never wore out. Forty years. They were fed, gave water. Well, how were they fed? The bread fell from the sky. Mom would tell me every once in a while, she said, I can remember. We would have no money, and I would reach to my purse, and I would, find, I would find the exact amount I needed to pay the electric bill. I know that wasn't in there. She reached to my purse, and there it was. I knew the Lord had put it there. Oh, my. Isn't that amazing? The Lord makes a way for his children. The source of all their singing was in heaven alone. They're not worried about they got beaten. They're not worried about that they're in the prison. As the other prisoners were listening to their prayers and songs of praise of the Lord, the prison was rocked with an earthquake. It opens all the doors and loose all the chains. But it did not demolish the building. When the jailer woke, he saw that the prison was wide open. I thought the prisoners had escaped. He knew his life was over, right? That was his circumstance. I'm going to die. They're going to kill me for letting these prisoners leave. So he draws a sword to end his own life. When Paul says, don't do that. We're all here. A new emotion sweeps over him. The fear of losing his job. And most likely his life gave way to a, a deep conviction of sin. Sirs, must what I do to be saved. Paul and Silas praised the Lord in the prison. The praise in a bad situation calls those around them to take notice and listen to them. Any man can sing song of praise when the prison doors are open and he is free. The true Christian soul sings in prison and in difficulty. I could have gave up. I could have just laid there and let my life slip away. I could have Made my way to the phone, which was back there, and called for 911. There's no faith in that. Lord, I'm out here in the middle of nowhere. Having a heart attack by myself late at night. I got nowhere else to go. I had nobody else to talk to. I need you now.
And obviously, he came through. Right? Amen. Give him praise. He did it. Not me. I'm standing on this stage this morning, and the ambulance didn't come and get me because they probably would have kept me. That's the God we serve. Just like Paul and Silas, their praise not only helped them, but also everyone else that was listening. An earthquake shook the prison, and the doors flew open, and everyone's chains fell off. Your praise, not, your praise might be the key to someone unlocking, to unlocking somebody else's chain. When suffering in a bad situation, our instinct is to escape, don't we? We don't want to hurt. We don't want to experience pain. We want to get out of it. That's the human nature. Only crazy people hold their hand over the fire and be like, ooh, that's hot. Typically, when it burns, you pull it back. Or if for whatever reason some kind of pain comes about you, the reaction normally is to get away from it. But how many of us know that that can't always happen? Some pain you have to go through. But our God, but our praise to a God in time of trouble, trouble has to be genuine. Because we are, uh, we are doing it knowing he's allowing it for our good or the good of others. What you might be experiencing is not about you. Right? Oh, he'll use it to mold you. He will use it to break you down. To get you into a relationship with him. But it's not about you. It's about the kingdom. It's about your testimony. When you stand up and you say, you know what? I put this on the wall over here to show you what the Lord did for me. I'm going to tell the world what the Lord's capable of. I'm going to praise his name for what he's done for me. All of it is his. Right? It's easy to praise God when we get a promotion, a proposal, long-awaited, fulfilled promise. It's much harder to praise the Lord when we're suffering. But when trouble comes in our lives, do we praise the Lord? Remember the storms. We're all going to face them. No matter what. Romans 8 and 28, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. A lot of the times we get into trouble or we go through a trial and we think the Lord has forsaken us. He's abandoned us. Lord, why are you kicking me when I'm down? It's for his testimony. It's for you to spread the word and to say, man, this is, what, this is what God did for me. You might go to work and have to testify to somebody. The guy that I work with who ended up with, he actually had kidney cancer. They removed it, they operated and they removed it, and they said, yep, it was stage one. And so we caught it early enough. You won't have to go through chemo. And so he was thanking the Lord and praising him. And then he kind of stopped. It was like, why do I got to go through this? He got like, so he's talking to me about it. And I said, well, you got your feelings. And I'm like, you had to go through that. And the doctors had to find him because you don't have enough faith for the Lord to heal it. And he said, man, that's kind of harsh. And I'm like, I'm just being real. And he said, but you're right. He said, 
He said, I, as I was praying, the Lord said, I led you to the doctors, the right doctors, who found what was wrong, and they removed it, and we caught it. They caught it early enough. He said, I allowed and led you that way. I said, see, the Lord did all that because he knew you wouldn't have enough faith for him to heal it. But now you see as you start to gain your faith and he starts to grow that. So he, he had to take a week off. He's healed, comes to work. He's praising the Lord. He's crying. He's telling somebody in the office about it. And somebody else says, Man, why are you getting so emotional? Nothing happened. He said, Nothing happened. Man, I had cancer. Ah, so? Now, granted, the person that he's talking to is a professing, professing Christian who also believes that God don't work like that no more. God don't heal. God don't deliver. There is no more supernatural power. Really? That's not what this says. I've never read where, where the Lord lost his power or gave it away. Why are you getting so emotional? He said, because what the Lord did for me. He led, he led me to the right doctors and led them to where the pain was and found it. I don't have to take medicine. I don't have to take chemo. I don't have to take radiation. They took it all out. Everything's done. Once these scars heal up, I'll be back to normal. That's why I'm emotional. Because the Lord delivered me from that mess and I didn't have to go through it. That's why I'm emotional. Because the God that I serve can do all things. Amen. Hallelujah. Like Paul and Silas, a supernatural earthquake at just the right time, God, God moves powerfully in our lives when our worship is authentic. No truer can it be than when we are in pain. That's when we cry out the, the most. We trust the Lord in every part of our lives, the good and the bad. When we surrender our, our suffering to him, knowing it's part of his plan, we find rest in his work. This is where we have to be. We have to realize that we might suffer, but it's part of his plan. God sets us free from our own prison. He loosens our feet from the shackles. Even, we're, even we are unaware that we are bound by. He heals what can only be healed by him. He touches what can only be healed by healed by him. I often wonder why do people why do people suffer more than others? Why do but the Lord's got a testimony. There can't be a testimony without a great test. Just the way it is. What we don't do can be as important as what we do. Our flesh will we might want to act. I could have laid there. I could have called for help. But when we stay still, we're going to impact somebody else's life. Christians are judged by the world. They look to see how we how we will act or what we'll do when we are in bad situations. Will we bust out the door and head for the hills when times get tough? Or will we seek God and search for his purpose in the circumstances we find ourselves in? What we don't do can be as important to a lost person keeping tabs on a believer in Christ. We all make mistakes. We're all called to a higher standard in the world. What we don't do is also important than what we do. I read a quote the other day. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasures you seek. 
Paul didn't plan to go into a prison, yet he was willing to submit to the Lord. This is the problem and some of the issue that we have. Continuing to praise him even in shackles. Paul's willingness to suffer and yet find joy in the moment is something that we can all apply to our own lives. Paul was in prisons many times, beaten with rods, shipwrecked, snake bit. And we tend to want to give up when times get a little tough. We need to worship. When we worship, the invisible God is at work doing invisible and powerful things. We get we got to get realized, refreshed, and refueled. We find unspeakable joy, indescribable peace in His presence. We discover the breakthrough strength of the Lord, which enable us to walk in truth, live in the presence, and see Him fight our battles for us. It is how we can put the beauty of the gospel on display, receive His many blessings, and at the same time be a blessing to the world. Jesus made it clear that the physical location of of our worship no longer matters. Yet the time has come for true worshipers to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father is seeking. God is spirit and his worships worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. True worship takes place on the inside within our hearts and spirits which is the dwelling place of God. Humans were created to worship the Lord. The purpose of the church beyond serving the Lord and spreading the gospel is to do what? Worship Christ Almighty. Is there enough of that? Can there ever be enough? No. There's not a lot going on, though, is there? True worship. God is the object of our worship. He alone is worthy of our praise and worship. Let's be like Jehoshaphat and praise the Lord before we ever go into battle, before we ever go into a storm. Let's praise the Lord. We're all going to see them, right? Storms are going to come. We either went out of one, we're going in one, or we're in one. We praise Him all the time. We just keep praising Him. Non-stop praise going into a storm thank you lord for the storm whatever you're trying to teach me thank you thank you for whatever testimony is going to come out of this thank you lord for all that you do thank you lord break me down till there is nothing left or we come out of the storm thank you lord for delivering me from this storm thank you for bringing us out right that's the mindset that we have to get to We'll be like Paul and Silas. And we'll praise the storm. We'll praise the Lord in the in the prison. While we're in the prison, while we're in the storm, while we're in the battle, before, after, all of it. As you say, I'm gonna go ahead and close. Do we praise the Lord? Do we get upset? Things didn't go our way? No matter what happens. The storm is going to come regardless. It's just life. We just praise the Lord anyway. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. But we have to praise Him. If we don't praise Him, who will? Will He make the rocks cry out for Him? Smith Wigglesworth said, Praise is God's sunlight in the heart. It destroys sin, sin germs. It ripens the fruit of the Spirit. It is the oil of gladness that lubricates life's activities. We need to show the Lord how much we love Him, and not just in the good times, in all the times, good, bad, or indifferent.